So I just wanted to start by welcoming everybody to this 0 p.m. webinar today. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Sarah Hale um, and I'm working for the German Water Centre. For those of you who don't know 0 p.m., it's a Horizon 2020 research project um, where we are looking at interlinking prevention, prioritisation and removal strategies to protect human health and the environment from persistent and mobile substances. And this is what the webinar is framed around today. Today, I actually have the pleasure of introducing three speakers and all three of these people are members of the Zero PM monitoring team, which means that they have expertise to be able to follow our project and support our goals and ambitions. So first of all, I would like to introduce you to Andre. Um, he is a senior policy advisor at the Association of River Waterworks. And Andre looks at drinking water quality in Belgium and the Netherlands. He's going to be talking to us about policy options and additional tools to protect drinking water sources. Then we are going to be hearing from Ulrich. He works at IWW in Germany and he's very involved in the trace analysis of persistent mobile and toxic substances. Ulrich also chairs um, the European Standardised Committee for Water Quality. And many of you are no doubt going to be seeing his most recent piece of work because he's working on a new European standard method for PFAS in drinking water at the moment. Ulrich is going to be talking about PFAS in European drinking waters. Then we will be hearing from Tim, who is Ulrich's colleague, also working at IWWW. Um, and he carries out research related to the occurrence, fate and mitigation of organic pollutants in the aquatic environment. So Tim's going to be talking to us today about pharmaceuticals in the environment. What I will ask is that all of you listening, please pose your questions using the Q&A function. And towards the end, after we've heard the presentations, Hans Peter will be looking at the questions and reading them out for everybody uh, so that the speakers can answer them. Any that we don't manage, hopefully we'll be able to follow up by email. So please don't use the chat, please don't raise your hand um, and please ask questions in the Q&A. So I think without further ado, I will let Andre start by sharing his screen and giving his presentation. Lovely, we can see this. Thank you, Andre. Thank you, Sarah, for the kind introduction and uh, welcome everybody, good afternoon. Like Sarah said, I'm André Bonnink. I'm a senior policy advisor at uh, the uh, River Waterworks in the Netherlands, and I would like to talk to you about the policy options and some other ways and tools to protect drinking water sources. Yes. Um, I would like to start off with telling you something about European legislation. Uh, currently, drinking water directive and the water framework directive are under revision, and there's some special interest in PFAS. Um, I would also like to talk about what happened with uh, the REACH revision and the COP uh, guidelines and the criteria that were uh, introduced for uh, assessing PMT. And then I would like to tell you something about the Dutch Working Group on Tackling Emerging Substances um, that we have in the Netherlands. And there's a special team group on PMT, on uh, persistency, mob mobile and toxic substances. And there's a PMT score uh, uh, made from this group by some 6,000 substances. And uh, this will be um, on the RIV RIVM website this summer. And if there's time left, then I would like to say something about the revision of permits due to uh, substances of very high concern. But let me start off with the European legislation on drinking water. There is a revised drinking water directive and in December 2020, it was uh, published. And uh, as of 12th of January of this year, it came into force. Uh, new in this directive, and I will focus on this, are the PFAS standards. Um, in, in January 2025, the European Commission will set methods for monitoring PFAS under these two new parameters in the drinking water directive called PFAS total and the sum of PFAS, and I'm sure Ulrich Borges will elaborate on that in his presentation later on. And by the 12th of January 2026, <clears throat> member states need to take measures necessary to ensure that water that is intended for human consumption, so drinking water, will meet these values that are mentioned in the drinking water directive. So like I said, there are two standards set for PFAS in the new drinking water legislation. Uh, there is a sum of 20 PFAS which needs to stay under 100 nanograms per liter. 
you find the 20 in, um, in this table on your screen. And there's also to be determined how PFAS total will be um, um, monitored. And uh, because there's an analytical method to be made for that, but I'm sure Ulrich will also be able to tell us a little bit more about that in his, uh, his presentation. But it's not only the drinking water standards that has been revised in Europe. There's also new legislation under the Water Framework Directive, and there's currently a proposal for a revision, which was published in October of last year. <clears throat> also in this proposal, uh, PFAS are mentioned, um, and there's a, um, a sum of P or 24 PFAS, which are mentioned here in this table, uh, set for a very low standard of 0.0044 nanograms per liter, but for equivalence of PFOA. Um, in the current uh, Environmental Quality Standards Directive, there are only two PFAS uh, mentioned, which are PFOS and PFOA. So now there's a standard set for at least 24 of them. 16 of these PFAS are the same as the ones mentioned in the 20 PFAS in the sum uh, of the Drinking Water Directive. Uh, but as you can see, the Water Framework Directive standard is quite quite lower than the 100 nanograms per liter that is mentioned in the Drinking Water Directive. There's one uh, explanation for that because this uh, new standard for the Water Framework Directive is based on the, the relative uh, potency factor and not on uh, single compounds. So everything in this uh, table is translated into uh, PFOA equivalents. That's the uh, abbreviation PEQ. And all of those summed up should stay under that very strict limit uh, for groundwater and surface water. But there's a difference now between what uh, the standards are in the Water Framework Directive uh, as far as a uh, number of substances concerned, but also uh, um, as the methodology is concerned uh, because the relative potency factor is taken into consideration. Anyway, uh, there are 20 PFASs mentioned in the Drinking Water Directive and 24 in the Water Framework Directive, which brings up to a total of 28 PFASs that are going to be or are regulated under the European legislation. But we already know from the seminar on uh, the 22nd of March of this year by Emma Szymanski that there are at least 6 million PFASs possible. And by now, she has already calculated that it runs into the million, 7 millions. So um, there's still some ground to be covered um, by the uh, 20, 24, and 28 PFASs, and they should be representative for a whole group of different PFASs. When, while we were at the Zero PM workshop in Gothenburg in February, ECHA published the restriction proposal for PFASs. And this proposal was done by uh, Denmark, Germany, the Netherlands, Norway, and Sweden. Um, it it um, basically uh, means a ban on PFAS uh, being used and produced in the whole of the European Union. So that covers more than the 28 mentioned in the legislation so far. <clears throat> Small reminder why, why there are PFAS restrictions necessary. Well, we know from uh, notorious cases such like Parkersburg, West Virginia, how a Teflon factory by DuPont polluted surface water and groundwater. That was the whole scenario behind the movie Dark Waters. Also, <clears throat> in Europe, there are some notorious cases, such as the contamination of the Veneto uh, area in Italy, where, hundred, where hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people uh, exposed to PFAS due to groundwater contamination in the area. But also, in the Netherlands, there is a copy of the same DuPont factory as there is in Parkersburg, uh, that produces Teflon in Dordrecht, and it's been there since uh, 1962. And it has contaminated ground and surface water with PFASs as well. So all <clears throat> over the years, more and more became clear about how this contamination came about. And there was a TV show last Thursday exposing the time limit of those toxic events. The TV show Zembla found out that the most hazardous properties of PFOA were already known to DuPont since 1961. And the more research was done <clears throat> on the toxicity and the more harmful and the more harmful PFOA turned out to be. 
And Dutch drinking water companies have found both PayFOA and its successor Gen X in their surface water sources and have since demanded more restrictions on emissions until the day. And until this day, there is a court case for drinking water companies against Kamur, but also several municipalities are involved in a court case against this successor of DuPont in Dordrecht. Cases like this have led to the drinking water sector advocating for criteria for persistence, mobile and mobile substances in the authorization and permitting of emissions. And indeed, such criteria have now been embedded in the authorization of chemicals in the European Union. A first step was taken when new hazard classes were added to the classification, labeling and packaging legislation, or CLP for brief. So two new hazard classes, PMT and VPM, 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 were introduced. So very persistent, very mobile is now also a hazard class under the CLP. So why do we need PMT criteria? Well, I think I'm preaching for the choir here, but let me remind you anyway why these criteria are necessary. Because of the cases like the PFAS contamination of drinking water sources, it became clear that certain chemicals uh, slip through the authorization process. So several research projects showed that there is a gap between uh, 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 that there's a gap that if substances are not just on judged on persistence and mobility, then two of these properties that make it very hard <clears throat> for a, a chemical to be removed in the current water treatment. So something needed to be done to better protect uh, water uh, drinking water sources. And over the years, UBA and NGI have prepared a set of criteria for, for persistence, mobility, very persistent, very mobility, and toxicity. And these criteria were dis discussed in the research world as well as in the REACH realms. Based on these European discussions and the PMT criteria, the Dutch PMT theme group was formed under a working group of tackling emerging substances in the Netherlands. This PMT uh, group started in uh, 20, uh, 2019 and is a collaboration between uh, parties like Ministry of the Infrastructure and Water Management, the Dutch National Institute for Public Health and the Environment, Rijkswaterstaat, which basically is the water board for the rivers, the water boards for all the other uh, smaller rivers in the Netherlands, and the drinking water companies are represented. This uh, PMT theme group started with a data set with the properties for over 65,000 different substances. Going over them one by one seems impossible. So a discussion started on how to prioritize so we could focus on substances of, or groups of substances which would be most likely to cause problems for drinking water production. A team from RIVM constructed a screening and scoring system based on the PMT criteria. How this was done is recently published. Chemicals are given a continuous score for persistency, mobility, and toxicity uh, potential based on the modeled indicators. All values are also aggregated into an overall PMT score, again, uh, ranging from zero to one. In the organization I work for, Riba Meus, we have a selection process for the most relevant substances hindering drinking water production. We constructed a list of substances and we uh, evaluate them every three years. And the latest one is from 2021. It consists of 30 substances or substance group. And a poster on how this was done was recently presented at CETAC Dublin. <clears throat> I have taken uh, the table from 30 substances and put the PMT scoring system by RLVM uh, uh, with it. So then you see this, uh, this table. You see the total PMT score per substance, and then the individual P, M, and T scores as um, the, the scoring system of the RIVM was uh, conducted. You see two, <clears throat> uh, uh, you see some empty boxes here because there's no data available. And if I found them already being evaluated by NGI and UBA, I've put the conclusion there as well. Um, you can see a, <clears throat> um, a different coloring system. You have a low to moderate potential when the score is between 0 and 0 0.33. You have a high potential if a score is between 0 0.33 and 0 0.5. And you have a very high potential when you have a score between 0 0.5 and 1. 
Also, you see several pharmaceuticals in this list, which are present in the river mass above the target value of the European River Memorandum, or 0.1 micrograms per liter. And I'm sure Tim Oosterbeek will elaborate on pharmaceuticals in his presentation. So we'll hear a bit more about that. The thirtieth parameter on our list of uh, relevant substances is the PFAS group, and we've now added the 20 PFASs that are mentioned in the new drinking water directive. But as you can see, the persistency score, the potential scores, all show a very high potential. So this um, uh, gives contribution to the label forever chemicals that these PFAS already have. Now I wanted uh, to share you something about using PMT criteria in the permitting process for emissions to surface water, but then I realized this would be a repetition of the presentation by Harry Timmer at the UBA workshop in 2021. So if you're interested about this topic, you can find the paper uh, Harry and I wrote on this topic in Water Solutions, or you can look at the presentation he gave at the um, at the UBA workshop. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Andre. So now we'll move to our next speaker. Um, and this will be Ulrich, who will share his screen. Uh, please do write your questions and answer, uh, your, not your answers, your questions in the chat. Uh, sorry, in the question and answer function. I realised I can't pose a question in there, which is a shame. Um, lovely. Ulrich, now you are set. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks. I hope you see my, my slide. I will give some brief for more information about PFAS in drinking waters. And as Sarah said, I have a focus on analytical aspects because I'm chairman of the European Sanitization Group, which is taking care of this task. And I will also show you some, some data from, from Germany. Um, I think some of the aspects have been said by Andre, so I must not repeat all of it, but just a few aspects. This is just for your information, the, the, the title page of the European Drinking Water Directive. I think you all know this one. And um, we have for European drinking waters two limits set by the Commission. The first one, as Andre said, is 0.5 microgram per liter for PFAS total, which is really a kind of sum parameter and addresses the totality of all per and polyfluoro acyl substances. And then the important thing is that the member states, European member states, are absolutely free to decide whether they use just both parameters or just one of both parameters. And as far as I am informed, most of the European member states have decided to just use the sum of PFAS and not the total PFAS parameter. In Germany, especially, we decided not to implement this one here. So the most of European member states have or are going to implement the 0.1 microgram per liter uh, limit value for the sum of PFAS, as uh, Andre pointed out. Um, this is, of course, a small subset of total PFAS substances, of all PFAS substances. And uh, as you have seen from Andre, we have, uh, sorry, this is in German, missed to, to, to take the right one, sorry. Uh, but this one here is a set of 10 carbonic acids. And on the right hand side, you see the uh, corresponding sulfonic acid. And highlighted, we find the four um, FSA PFASs, the P4 and PFOS. And the other two ones, and I come to this uh, aspect for Germany uh, a few minutes later. Um, as Andre also pointed out, the Commission uh, has um, published in Article 13 of the directive that they are going to come up with some technical guidelines for the method of analysis for both of these parameters. And uh, the Article 13 reads, uh, methods and detection limits, parametric values and frequency of sampling. At the time being, it's quite clear that the Commission is not in the situation to alter or to give any new uh, recommendations or requirements for parametric values because they are set at the moment. And also the frequency of sampling is uh, at the moment sorted out in the directive. So this uh, must just focus on the analytical aspect here. And as Andres also said, the Commission uh, um, has uh, drafted this Article 25, saying that 
this transition period is allowed. So the limit value in drinking water is only uh, valid up uh, later than 12th of January 26. But in Germany, most of the public authorities ask the water suppliers to do samples much earlier because this is the date where the limit value must be kept. And if you need to install, let's say, uh, water treatment or something like this, you, you, you must have this information about PFAS much earlier. Um, we are at the moment consulting the Commission as regards the PFAS methods. Uh, we have got this uh, service contract you see here on the right-hand side, and together with uh, TZW in Karlsruhe, University of Copenhagen and Örebro University um, in Sweden, we are at the moment uh, consulting the Commission as regards analytical methods. I mean, for the sum of PFAS, I mean the 20 PFAS, it's quite easy, but for the total PFAS parameter, it's quite, quite a tricky thing. In Germany, we not only implemented this 100 nanogram per liter limit value for the 20 PFASs, but we are also uh, we have also decided to implement a national uh, additional limit value for the sum of four PFASs. This is of course the EFSA PFASs, PFAS, P4, PFNA, and PF hexanic uh, sulfonic acid, and uh, this is a uh, special national parameter. And as far as I am informed, not many other European member states have decided to, to go for this uh, EFSA-based uh, additional value here. Um, the 20 nanogram per liter limit value we are going to implement is, of course, a kind of compromise. And uh, the UBA environmental agency and also the German legislator said that the maximum value must uh, take into account the toxicological aspects, of course, such values must be tolerable from the toxicological aspect. And but and in addition, they must also be feasible as regards analytical and technical aspects. And it must also be financeable. So our German 20 nanogram per liter limit value is a kind of a step by step plan. And in Germany, we have at the moment the plan to go down may be down to this uh, two nanogram per liter value, which is uh, more or less proposed by the EFSA. But at the moment, we have no concrete time plan, no concrete uh, further information besides the aspect that it is a kind of step-by-step -step plan. Very few analytical aspects. At the moment, we are, as uh, Andre mentioned, on the way to publish a European standard. And you could be sure or more or less sure that this method here uh, will possibly be recommended or prescribed by the commission. At the moment, you see the date here, 19th of June. This is today. Uh, today, we are sending out uh, samples for the validation ring trial. And after this ring trial, we are more or less ready. And at the end of this year, this uh, standard will possibly be published. This is just a, an impression of the front page of the standard. It is, of course, an LCMS method and uh, specially designed for PFAS in drinking water. But of course, it could also be used for other freshwater types. You see here, we are at the moment heading to uh, guarantee a limit of quantification in the area of one nanogram per liter. Of course, it is um, lab depending, but the method itself is suitable to do one nanogram per liter. And uh, with these special techniques here, large volume injection or SPE technique, you can possibly go down to 0.2 nanogram per liter as with the LOQ. But all of this is very much depending on the blank value you can achieve in your lab. Uh, so that not every lab is possibly able to come to 0.2 nanogram per liter. And we have some additional limitations for the short chain PFASs because the polarity is quite high. And of course, we have uh, many problems with the bigger PFASs, I mean the long chain PFASs, because of very, very heavy adsorption effects on bottles, materials and so on. The prescription, I mean, the performance requirement from the directive is that you have to um, 
ensure a measurement uncertainty of a maximum of 50%, and you must uh, uh, must come up with the LOQ of 1.5 nanogram per liter or lower for each individual sub substance. Finally, just some information on German drinking waters. We have uh, performed last year and we have made an update this year, um, big uh, survey on available drinking water data. These are all really uh, relevant data from the practical purpose. And we got data from the Environment Agency, from Bavaria, from TZW and our own data. And you, as you can see here, in Germany, we have at the moment the estimation that roughly 4% of German drinking waters may run into problems with the future limit value for drinking waters. And if we take the same data set and just uh, look to the four EFSA PFASs, of course, the number or the ratio of problematic samples is a bit higher. We, we, are, we are estimating that roughly 5.6% of German drinking waters may run into trouble with this lower German national limit value of 20 nanogram per liter. What we find is, uh, can you, you can see here, this is a con concentration distribution of the uh, relevant uh, uh, substances. And as you can, can see here, can you, as you can see here uh, especially the um, butanoic sulfonic acid is a problem. The highest concentration we have for this C4 substance here. Of course, we have also C6 and the others. And another information is that for German drinking waters, we see no real relevance of uh, the long, longer chain substances. So uh, we have absolutely very, very few findings also for this C10 to C13 substances. So that I would not say that for drinking waters, we have really to do with millions of PFASs. I mean, this is always, of, uh, this is mostly focused on the, on the shorter chain ones. And finally, uh, as regards treatment, just one, one, one information, or maybe you know this, of course, most of the common treating uh, treatment um, procedures for drinking water do not work quite well here. Most of them are unsuitable and we absolutely have to rely on adsorption with, with activated carbon or we have also some ideas on ion exchange and of course membrane filtration is also an option but membrane filtration has really a high energy consumption and somebody who's doing membrane filtration knows that you have to find a solution for your concentrates. So this is just a very, very brief information about treatment. I think this is my very, my very short contribution and I'm happy to, to hear and to answer your, your question. Thanks. Thanks very much, Ulrich. I saw that some people have put some questions in the Q&A. So please <clears> do, <throat> Ulrich, you can have a look at those. We can answer them later or you can type an answer if you'd like to. Um, as we move on now to our last speaker for today, so that will be Tim. Tim Thank you, Sarah. Brilliant. I'll quickly share my screen. So, sorry. There we go. <clears throat> All right. Thank you so much for inviting me. And uh, also thanks to Andre and Ulrich for already um, setting the scene and uh, very uh, interesting slides regarding PFAS and also Andre to already introducing pharmaceuticals so they're also a very important um, PMT topic. So my name is uh, Tim Osterbeek, I'm head of the Department of Water Resource Management. So and as Ulrich is the head of the lab basically of all the water quality issues, um, I'm, I'm rather working on you know raw water. So what is influencing basically raw water quality in the end before you know it actually goes to go somewhere else. And I will give an overview of a project I did uh, together with Uber uh, in Germany a while ago, but uh, I thought I will show this presentation because there has been updates um, on, on this issue. And I would like to share them with you because probably some people already know the database and the publications around it, but I think this is a good opportunity to also show you some updates. So we did the, the project um, a couple of years ago 
because um, it was um, rather unclear if um, pharmaceuticals are really a global problem in the environment. And um, this has uh, also been due to the fact that um, UNEP um, has, a, has a group called SICOM, Strategic Approach on International Chemicals Management. And the aim of UBA and also the German government was to include pharmaceuticals in, in, in this global initiative. Because if you include it in this global initiative, you can do really, um, you know, help to to provide some global measures and funds, and make it, uh, yeah, be be rather mitigating the problem. So um, we we did this project, and then we thought, okay, how can we do this? And we said, okay, we need to set up a global database, which is. Um, you know, geographically um, located so that we can really pinpoint where do we find which concentrations and um, how can we analyze them all together. So, and then in the end, it was also important then to derive measures, what could be done also on the global scale to mitigate the occurrences of the pharmaceuticals we've, we found and we depicted in, in the database. And I will not go into the details of the mitigation issues. That would be a, an, an probably another 15 minutes at least uh, just to, to list all the different measures um, we have. So, but the take home message is that we, you know, want to, to get the global picture of the occurrences of pharmaceuticals. And so how did we do it? We just got all the information we could get. So that means we, um, in the end, now with the new database with the version three by now, there were more than 2000 publications um, which had measured environmental concentrations in that of pharmaceuticals. So that means we, looked at much more publications, of course, but in every publication we found where you would have concentration values, we would um, transfer them to a database. So that was a lot, a lot, a lot of work. As you can imagine, um, just, you know, reading all those papers and typing all those those concentrations and all the, you know, the meta information um, into it. So the data database itself, it has, um, I think, something like um, 25, 30 filters. So you have lots of meta information as well. Yeah, and so, yeah, you can see how we how we um, collected all these these literature data. Uh, we also looked at research projects um, and, and also the Norman network, etc. And uh, we also had some help from colleagues um, all over the world to translate um, all these these different um, publications, which were not in English or German, um, which is much easier now, I guess, with ChatGPT. But we didn't have that uh, some years ago. So. How does the database in the end look like? So how many did we find? I already mentioned that we have more than 2,000 publications. And what's interesting is that we have data from 89 countries by now. So we have a bit more than 200 globally. So that means we have um, quite a good um, coverage of, of data, which already allows us um, to derive later on um, if it's a global issue or not. Because if we would only have data from, I don't know, 20 countries, then it would be difficult to, to say in the end if, if, if it's a global problem or not. And uh, then the measured environmental concentrations, um, we found more than 275,000. So that's a lot of data um, in this database. And especially if you consider that some of the, the MEC data um, refers to many, many samples. For example, a publication might um, publish that, for example, the average diclofenac concentration was 0.1 microgram per liters, and uh, the average was taken from 120 samples. So we only have one data then in the database, but we have many, many more samples uh, in the background. That means we have um, basically um, yeah, millions of samples um, in the background of this database. And then when you look at um, the positive detections, um, then you can see that, um, that nearly half or a bit less 40% um, were actually positive detections. I mean, there's of course a bias because you usually publish um, data. If, if you if you find something, if you don't find anything, you may not publish it. But uh, in the end, this this already shows you that that this is uh, quite an issue in the end. And then if you look further down, if you look at the positively detected substances, so the number of substances found, that's close to one thousand different pharmaceuticals um, and transformation products, um, metabolites, etc., being found in in the environment. So this is quite a big number. So, and this already might help you, for example, in your daily work, if you, um, for example, uh, find some pharmaceuticals in your own um, drinking water or catchment or wherever you work on, 
and then you you might be interested in in analyzing is this a problem what what are general concentrations somewhere else um is this an issue so I, myself i use this database quite a lot um also to you know to to get a feeling for for concentrations and uh, for occurrences so how often are these um substances detected so then if you Nope, oh, that was one. So if you then um, look here at the at the number um, of publications, uh, looking at the at the global perspective, and uh, what you first notice, there are some white spots. So especially in Africa and uh, Central Asia, especially uh, where we don't have any data at all. So um, that's of course not surprising. So generally, in in developing countries, there there is less research available. So basically what I was saying is that when you look at developing countries, you have, of course, less data available, um, which is not surprising because you, have, you don't have the infrastructure and so on. So you have other issues which are important. But uh, usually when you look at, at data from developing countries, it's sometimes from projects, you know, um, from, from abroad, taking samples there, bringing them back home and analyzing them um, back home. Um, that's what we also do for in, in multiple countries um, uh, in different projects these days. But what you can see here is that we have some, some countries where you have lots of data available. Uh, for example, if you see all the green countries here, um, China, Germany, Spain, the US, uh, there you have lots of data um, available. And um, this can already, you know, Endpoint, um, especially for the for the richer countries, for the industrialized countries, that can show you some some good information. But um, for the developing countries, it's uh, it's a bit more difficult. But at least we say we have the global coverage um, in general, and that we can that we think that that our results are, can explain or can, can depict the situation regarding pharmaceuticals in the environment. So then if you look at uh, the number of, uh, of database entries, so the measured environmental concentrations being found, that of course correlates um, to, to the number of publications, um, but there are some changes, um, which you can see if you take a closer look at the database. Um, but nevertheless, it's of course the, 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 the four countries I mentioned before, but also other um, countries, uh, for example, in Scandinavia and so on, have no more data. But um, this is already, um, quite good if, if you want to, to look at the, the general occurrence of data and also if you want to compare between countries, if you have so much data, especially for, um, for, for some countries, um, so then this, this makes, makes it you know, readily available to, to compare um, the situation that also, this way you can also analyze mitigation um, options or how mitigation was done in various countries and then, then compare the different strategies which are um, currently uh, on the way in these countries. Then we took a closer look at uh, the type of con the type of pharmaceuticals. So, what kind of pharmaceuticals do we actually find? I mentioned that it's nearly one thousand different pharmaceuticals being found. And then, if you if you look at the uh, at the top list here, you can um, see that it's uh, mainly diclofenac. Uh, ibuprofen, carbamazepine, and sulfamethoxazole. So these are the the four big. Um, the four big compound substances where you have high concentrations. And uh, you notice that these are, of course, then in the end, uh, diclofenac, ibuprofen are, you know, um, global, global front runners because they, they're used a lot and in every country have been, so they're typical analgesics um, which you use. And then if you look at the different um, UN regions, so these are not continents, but UN regional groups, um, you can notice that, of course, the Western Europe and others um, is, is quite big here, but that's not a surprise because as I said earlier, there's more, more data and more funds available and more knowledge already available to do this kind of these kind of analysis. Um, but nevertheless, um, but please uh, be reminded that Western Europe and others, the others, for example, include the US, Canada, Australia, and so on. So that's why it was not nice at the UN meetings because the, the US were, were always asking, why are we others? <laughs> But um, in the end, uh, yeah, it's it's uh, quite a nice picture, and you can see also the differences in in, in pharmaceuticals. So that that some are more often, for example, in Asia, especially antibiotics, were far more often measured in in Asia. Maybe because it's a production country um, for, or continent, or rather, for example, in India and China, um, lots of antibiotics for also for the global market are produced, and that's probably why you would also find them more often um, in the environment. 
So then we were looking at the sources. Um, did this, um, this, I mean, the database I mentioned, there are many filters. And whenever we got the information from the publication, if there was a source given, for example, it was taken at the, at the discharge of a wastewater treatment plant or as a hospital and so on, or aquaculture, then we would add this to the database. But as you can see here, that for most of, of the database, uh, it is unknown. So because usually when you take a sample in a river, you can't really tell where a concentration might come from, what's upstream. So um, that's why, of course, it is rather unknown. But what we've seen is that, that especially urban areas um, and especially um, wastewater treatment plants are a major contributor. But locally, we can have high, really, really big hotspots, um, for example, because of hospitals or agriculture and so on. And you, you notice that there is also um, a difference. Um, this also might be a shop bias um, here, for example, if you look at Africa, um, there's lots of data on, on uh, animal farms and, and agriculture and so on, uh, which is not the case, for example, in, uh, in Eastern Europe or Grulag, which is uh, mainly South America. So then I wanted to tell you a little bit because my time is running out um, about uh, Pnex. So I guess you all know the concept of, of um, Pnex, predict no effect concentrations. So these are concentrations where we compare to uh, the data we found. And um, this is still now version one, the first version of the data. I haven't seen these maps for the, for the new version. But what we can say here is, for example, are the average diclofenac concentrations in surface water. And um, you can see there's uh, less data available because it's also the, the first version of the database. But you can see um, that there is uh, quite a difference in average concentrations. And then if you look at the country list, what we found, um, then this is uh, yeah, this is quite astonishing. All these countries here are exceeding the, the, the current PNAC. And um, for example, um, if you look at Germany, um, we are, uh, the average is, is much higher than actually what the PNAC is. So that means that the concentrations are definitely definitely too high. And but on the other hand, you might see, you see the sample size here. And for some countries, if you only have a handful of samples, this is of course not, not very reliable. And then if you look at maximum uh, ethanol estrid oil concentrations, um, you see a similar picture that there is um, a, quite a, a range of concentrations. And but also here, um, all the, the countries uh, depicted here in this table uh, have a, a higher concentration. Um, a higher PNIC than, than high, high concentration than PNIC. All right, so the conclusions are, so pharmaceuticals occur globally. So that was the first um, thing we had to, to show and that we found them in 98 countries and uh, that there is data available for emerging developing countries, but that's um, still lower than in Western countries. And um, in most countries, the pharmaceuticals um, prevail at concentrations above PNIC in surface waters so that we there might be adverse ecotoxicological effects. Um, and as I said, urban wastewater is uh, globally the dominant uh, emission pathway. And yeah, and what, what I was showing is that in the end, um, when the database was finished and we had all the results, um, so we went together with Uber and the German uh, Environmental Ministry. We went to Geneva and uh, went to the to the global UNEP meeting with all countries present. And they represented the results. And in the end, um, it was accepted that pharmaceuticals are emerging pollutants in Sycam. So um, this has been a major contribution in the end, the project. And this was very helpful. Even though the discussions, I think they were until one o'clock in the morning um, with the various countries, especially India and the US, I remember, um, were yeah, a bit against it. But in the end, uh, we managed uh, to, to pull this uh, through. So on the database is updated, as I said, so I showed, you know, version three, most of the, the maps, and it's online available if you don't know it yet. So you can download the database here. I mean, Sarah will, will share the slides afterwards, so you don't have to copy it. Um, you can download the database here for free. You will also find the full report um, and all additional figures. And there's also um, a publication in environment toxicology and chemistry regarding the first version of the database where you can, you know, take a closer look. Um, into, into the research results we found. So, and that's it. Thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to your questions. Yes, well, well, thanks so much, uh, Andre van Eyck, Ulrich Burchers and Tim van der Beek for three excellent and comprehensive presentations on protecting drinking water sources from persistent and mobile substances. 
So we're now going to open the Q&A section, and I see there's already been a lot of lively discussion there already, and some questions have already been answered. Uh, so if you haven't checked out the Q&A section, I encourage you to do so to see what, what the chat was going on during the presentations and perhaps um, answer a question yourself. And so now we'll just uh, go over to some of the questions and I'll just start uh, putting them in order and we'll see how that goes with time. With, we have 12 more minutes. So the first uh, question goes to Andre Banik from his presentation, I believe on the RIV MPMT score. Why has TFA trifluorosidic acid such a low P score? Well, that's an excellent observation. And it's exactly the same observation as one of our members made last week. And since we are meeting uh, this Wednesday morning, I will sure, should make sure to ask RIVM if there was maybe a mistake or how they calculated the P score for uh, uh, tri, what was it, trifluoroacetic acid? Mm -hmm. Yes, TFA for short. So yeah, um, I'll, I'll come back to you with that if, if I get the answer from RIVM. Oh, and I would also like to correct a mistake I made in one of the slides suggesting that uh, there was an extremely low uh, standard for uh, PFAS. Um, so I mixed up the um, micrograms per liter with the nanograms per liter. So Sarah, I corrected that. So if you would be so kind as to correct it also in the in the handouts, that would be perfect. Thank you so much. Um, the next question from uh, Rahul Agarwal, uh, as European PhD student. Is there any database of water quality, uh, chemical quality of different European countries? Um, I don't know who'd like to answer that. That might be related to a pharmaceutical uh, overview. So was that a question for me? Sorry, I didn't get it. Yeah, well, it, do you know of any database of water quality of different uh, European countries? Well, um, there is, for example, you can look at um, the, the global databases or European databases, such as Norman from the Norman network. You have a, a big database. Now you have this on, on pharmaceuticals where you can look into the data and you can use filters. So you can, for example, filter by country um, and then just you know pick the countries you're interested in and, and then you can also do some statistics with it. Um, there's also one regarding pesticides. I think it's from JRC and you have the IPCAM from JRC as well. Um, probably it's now um, been, been um, integrated there. Hmm. No, thanks, uh, Tim. Yeah, and I was going to mention the IPK, IPCAM as well because that is one of their mandates to collect monitoring data from, for instance, Horizon projects and compile it there. So that's a good go-to. Uh, next question from Thomas Vine at NTNU. Um, it was mentioned at the beginning of the webinar that the PMT score of 6,000 substances will be published on the webpage. Is this correct? And if so, where? And when will this be published? Thank you. <laughs> Andre. Yes, the, um, the original date, and I think it's still valid, is uh, for publication is the 23rd of June, so next week. And I will place the uh, link where it uh, should be uh, found, this whole uh, 6,000 substances and their scores uh, in the chat. So um, I hope as, 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 as much as anybody else that it, that it will succeed to be published next week. But uh, if it's later, I'll also will let you know. Thank you. And I'll have this as a open question. It's a, it's a big question. The next one from Jamie Smith. Do you think that these policies, and I think that the Water Framework Directive and the Drinking Water Directive should apply to all PFAS or just certain types, given that some like fluoropolymers are much less toxic? And if so, how do you think we should go about classifying them? Would anybody like to weigh in on that? But maybe to put it another way, uh, it's interesting that it was mentioned Ulrich that uh, more countries were uh, going for the sum PFAS rather than the total PFAS. Um, is this maybe just a practical consideration? Yeah, and I think most of the harmful PFASs are covered by the both the 20 and the 24, but I don't know if Ulrich has any yeah. more on that. No, that's that's absolutely true. It's also my, my, my impression, as I said in my presentation, that for drinking waters, if you are just talking about drinking waters, it is really the, the, the most relevant substances are in the set of 20. This is, should be okay. And the other thing is that if you're going to analyze these, uh, this tricky total PFAS parameter, you can do it, let's say, by AOF, uh, probable organic fluorine or so, uh, think, 
everything is in this parameter goes to this parameter what is uh, what can be detected by the method but this is of course tricky because also other other organic trace compounds contain fluoride fluorine which is uh, which is a problem and therefore again i would not expect at the moment that the commission is going to set more limit values uh, for drinking water i mean more drinking water values for targeted substances and uh, not sure how the future of this uh, total PFAS parameter is. Mm -hmm. no, thanks. Uh, thanks for that insight. Um, so next question goes, uh, goes to Sarah. Uh, can we have a copy of the presentations? Thank you. Now it's from Mark uh, Skilvio Niotis. I'm sorry, I mispronounced that name. Yes, I will send a link to the webinar once it's on YouTube and also a copy of the presentations. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, this question from Bastian Schaefer to Tim. How many of the 276,895 MECs did you find to be a potential risk, i.e. exceeding predictive no effect concentrations? That's, that's a good question. And that's also up to all the researchers out there, there to use the database. So um, I only analyzed the first version of the database in detail, and that had about half of less than half of the max found. Um, and uh, we only looked at specific compounds. And now the, the PNEX, for example, have changed again. Uh, for example, for diclofenac, it was 0.1 microgram per liters when I did the analysis. Now it's, it's, uh, it's a different one. So um, uh, I think um, this database has not been mined uh, really uh, really well so far. So I think there's so much information and data available. We could write many interesting publications about. So um, please everyone just download the database and do this kind of analysis. Yes. No, indeed, it's very rich. And uh, I've consulted it many times. There's a lot of interesting uh, things to see there. Um, yeah, this is a question I think also to you, Tim, from uh, Eirik uh, Schobeheide. Uh, astonishing that metformin is not at the top of the positive detected. Why? And I, I've been seeing a lot more metformin in the literature these days. So, what? Yeah, why? Yeah, good question. Um, that might be again country dependent. Um, so you might look also different continents. That might be an issue for, um, for example, older um, countries like the Western um, countries, maybe less in Asia. Um, but also. Um, all this data now is up from, so the first version of the database was up to 2015, I think. All the data that we could find to 2015, now the second one or third one now is to 2020. So um, there might be more data coming in. And I think that in the future, metformin will, will um, easily reach um, the top 20 or top 50. I'm pretty sure of that. Yeah, yeah no, it is a, it is a time, time issue. Uh, and this next question is also to you, uh, since you're answering so quickly, um, from Belen Gonzalez. Positively detected is really dependent on if the pharmaceutical was targeted or not in the study. What about concentrations, or at least relative positive detection? Yeah, we, we looked, of, of course, um, into into concentrations, but it, it's quite difficult, for example, regarding the statistics. So some data, for example, would only show you min or max values. Some would show you median values. Some would show you percentile values. So it was very difficult to, to statistically uh, analyze all the data. So in the end, we, we also referred to positively detected uh, values so that, that we could show, okay, this is um, this gives you a better um, idea of, of the results than, than doing the full statistical analysis about all the data there is. Um, and also then if you look, for example, that you have different detection limits in, in, uh, over the time uh, and also regarding different regions. Um, so this is also an issue here. Uh, thanks. And right now I'm looking at the time and I see the next two questions are also to you, Tim, from Bjorn Hitting and Yuan de Younga, so maybe you want to check those out. I'll see if we can go back to them. I'm going to go to uh, an anonymous attendee. Um, uh, and this is about, I guess, where the, uh, the drinking water limits came from. On which risk mitigation or risk assessment are the drinking water limits now in future based? And is there a publication which is published? I know the answer to that, but I think I'll let um, Andrea Ulrich take that. Well, I think the, um, the, the EFSA um, um, was the first organization in Europe that came with the um, look at the PFO equivalence. And uh, so everything is expressed in the PFO equivalence to make it comparable as, as far as, uh, as risk is concerned, the risk assessment is concerned. And I think uh, the limits might've been based on that, but also on 
the uh, uh, concentration found already. And I, but I think something happened between the drinking water directive and the publication of the new uh, water framework direction, directive revision. So I think more knowledge was put into the latter than into the first. And I think there's still a discussion going on about do we have to introduce uh, yeah. therefore equivalence in the drinking water assessments as well? Am I yeah, correct, that, Uli? Yeah, yeah, that's right. I mean, at the moment, there's no real discussion about this, uh, this, uh, this issue. I mean, it could make sense, but at the moment, there's no discussion. And it is, of course, also some kind of tricky because uh, this uh, approach for the environment area really poses a very, very big new question to the to the analyt analytical part, because uh, for some of the substances, you have to go down to very, very low LODs and LOQs, which is not quite easy. I mean, it could make sense because, as, as you have seen, we, we quite often find these uh, C4 substances, and uh, they are not so toxic. So the problem for the drinking water suppliers is that they have, of course, to, to install a treatment because if you have just a, um, a problem with the C4, I mean the, the sulfonic acid, you must install a treatment, but knowing that uh, the these substances are not so toxic. I mean, again, uh, to summarize, it could be an idea to implement also the RPF, -ish, RPF approach to drinking water, but not in the next few years, few years, I would say. And um, I can also point to a shear document uh, from the European Commission where the RPFs were derived. That, that was one of the documents that I think were in the middle of the drinking water directive and the water framework directive draft. Okay, I'm gonna take, uh, there's more questions. We won't have time to get all. I'm just gonna ask this one from, um, from a lawyer. Who's uh, Luis Philip Tres? He was. Uh, he said hello. Thank you for the wonderful webinar and the interesting topic that you brought forward. As a lawyer, so my apologies whether I have the technical aspect wrong. I was just curious whether the Court of Justice of the European Union already handled some cases about exceeding PFAS levels in drinking water sources in some member states. Do you maybe uh, a source to that case as well? I mean, uh, do we have any court cases we could point to? I mean, at the moment, the uh, for drinking just for drinking water. If you speak about drinking water, the 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 limit values are not into force at the moment. As you have heard in the beginning of my my presentation, they will come into force from the 12th uh, January of 26. Then, let's say, it took it will take a year or more than one year, and then some cases could be could come up. But at the moment, we have no 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 cases at, uh, here in Germany as well. And then I think I'm looking at the time and we like to be punctual with these webinars. And so we didn't get to all the questions and answers, but these will be circulated to the speakers. And we hope there'll be a chance that uh, one of the speakers or, or us will have an opportunity to answer them. And so with that, I wanna thank you for watching this, uh, this webinar and our science policy webinar. Our next webinar is actually tomorrow at 9.30 Central European time, where we'll be talking with Australians. Uh, about uh, regulatory chem informatics and some tools that they've been developing in Australia to use big data to handle regulatory issues of PFAS and other problems. And that would be led by Glenn Walker and Daniel Weber. So please join us tomorrow. And from us at 0 p.m., uh, Sarah Hill and myself and our speakers, Andre, Ulrich and Tim, I just want to thank you all for watching and see you next time. Bye, everyone. Thank Goodbye, you thank much. you. 0 p.m. Zero pollution of persistent and mobile substances. This project has received funding from the European Union's Horizon 2020 Research and Innovation Programme under grant agreement number 10103675